blessing to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen? It's good to see each one of you today. I know I haven't given a personal hello to all of you yet, but I am very happy to see each of your faces here this morning. I pray that God would encourage you as we open up His Word and study this morning. And it's really about trusting Him. The title of the message today is, Can You Trust Him? Amen? We're going to be looking in Luke chapter number 22. Luke chapter number 22, and I'm going to read verse number 35 to start, but we are going to go back up to verse 1. Luke 22, 35 says this, And He, being Jesus, said unto them, When I sent you without purse and script and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said nothing. Father, we love You. We thank You so much for Your goodness to us. I pray, Lord, that You would encourage our hearts this morning. I know there are so many different prayer requests here uh, that have been brought up even this morning. Lord, I pray that You'd meet with Your people, encourage our hearts, help us to draw closer to You, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter number 22. Interesting story here, interesting event, and I would encourage us to really pay close attention to what's happening here. This is the time approaching the Passover. And so Jesus is here and the Feast of the Passover is drawing nigh and a series of events begins to uh, take place here. And it's important to note what his, his audience or who his audience is. He's got his disciples with him, of course, and he's, he's really teaching multitudes of people. But as we look here at the message that is given to his disciples in trusting him, I pray that God would encourage your heart. Now the Bible says in verse number one, now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. And so there were some things that were going on here. Uh, the, uh, the Passover was drawing nigh. The chief priests were animate that they were going to get Christ. They wanted to take His life. And you know, I don't think in what I view in Scripture here in my, of my Savior, I do not see Him shaking in His boots over this. Amen? He knew exactly what was happening. And He's about ready to teach a series of lessons that people just need to trust Him. He has everything worked out. He's got the plan worked out. Now, I don't know for you guys, you might be professional planners in your life. I am not a professional planner in terms of being able to see things come out exactly how I'd want them to. You know, I remember years ago, um, I was taking a trip to Minnesota, and boy, I dressed real nice when I left. I had my, my suit stuff on and my dress shoes and for some strange reason, I left my tennis shoes behind. And I was going to be gone for a number of days, and I left my tennis shoes behind. And you know, normally my wife actually does the packing for me. And that's how I get to where I am supposed to be with all the things that I need to have because my wife participates in that process. But I remember as I was taking this trip, I didn't realize I'd forgotten my shoes until I got to the hotel room and I went to go ahead and change. And man, I don't have my tennis shoes with me. And so I thought, well, I've got this under control. I know where they sell shoes. I went down to the, the Mall of America there in Minnesota, and I bought a pair of tennis shoes, fairly inexpensive shoes, to be able to get around for that week. And uh, boy, I got to the end of the week, and I was getting ready to pack my stuff up to catch that flight to get back home here. And you'll never believe what I forgot in the hotel room. I forgot those shoes. Man, I only wore them a few times, and, and they didn't cost me a great deal of money, but nonetheless, it was money, and God gave them to me, and I left them in the hotel room. And I remember being on my flight headed home thinking, man, how, how could I leave those shoes behind? Not only I forgot my own shoes at home, but then I got some, and then I forgot them as I left. And uh, thankfully, when I got back home, um, the Lord worked it out. I made a call to the hotel, and believe it or not, the person who had cleaned the room actually took those brand new pair of shoes down to the desk and turned them into somebody that was in charge. And they mailed me my shoes in the mail, praise the Lord. And so I got my new tennis shoes back here in California. But man, I really mucked it up. I, I, I didn't do very good in planning. And um, you know what? I'm thankful that our Lord and Savior has everything under control, and, and He knows how to plan things. We've got to recognize that we cannot depend on ourselves, even in the simplest things. We've really got to rely on our Lord and Savior. And then, of course, we've got to use our, our brains the best that we can. 
Um, but the Bible goes on to tell us here, this time the Passover is coming, the, the chief priests are, are animate at going after and killing him. That is their goal. Verse number 3, I want us to see something very important. The Bible says here, Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And so as the people of that day, the scribes and the chief priests were getting wound up and they were really wanting to go after Christ, they really wanted to take His life, they weren't pulling any punches about it, they said, we need to kill Him. Verse number 3, our enemy steps right into the midst of that. And I don't want us to be deceived in any way thinking that things that are... uh, you know, as we live our lives, we have lots of different things and lots of different attacks that come upon us during the week um, as we live our days. And you know, some things may happen um, just because of uh, the world and the laws that God has put into place on this planet. I mean, after all, if I went out and jumped off the building, gravity is still going to take effect, right? I'm still going to fall to the ground. Um, but you know, <coughs> excuse me, as we look here at Uh, the devil coming right in. He is responsible and his minions, those fallen angels, are responsible for a lot of the bad stuff that goes on in our minds and in our hearts and the challenges that we face. We do have a true enemy. And the enemy steps in here immediately in verse number 3 and enters into that uh, disciple there named Judas Iscariot. Verse number 4 says, And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. And so the plan begins to unfold almost immediately. Verse 5 says, And they were glad and covenanted to give him money. And so they came up with an agreement. They came up with a plan as to what they were going to do. The scribes and the, the chief priests that were leading this effort there. And Judas Iscariot is now a part of this plan. And we know that the devil is influencing what's happening here. He's coming in and, and not only is the, the goal of the, the chief priests and the scribes to kill Jesus Christ, but our enemy, the devil, knows who Jesus Christ is for a fact. And he thinks that if he can squish him out and stop what he's about to do here on this planet, boy, then he may just have the victory. But we know that we win in the end, amen? And he's, he's still going to fight tooth and nail until the very end, um, but we win in the end. But the devil is really doing everything he can here, and he's using this man, Judas Iscariot. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of of the multitude. They came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And so these men, they come and they want to betray Him. They know they can't do it with those great crowds that are around. A lot of people were uh, enjoying the miracles that Jesus was performing. And man, if they would have came and tried to take Him, man, it might have caused something that would have uh, uh, cost the lives of many of the scribes and Pharisees. And so they understood that if they were going to take Him, they were going to have to do it in more of a private setting. They were not going to be able to have all these folks around that were really witnessing like the blind man that saw it all, witnessing the things that Jesus Christ had done. There was no denying what He was doing in this place. But yet the enemy had recruited some folks and they were after the life of Jesus Christ. I want us to take a look here, verse number 8, as we begin to read. The Bible says here, "...and He sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat." And as Jesus goes about to prepare for this Passover meal that's going to come to place here, or come to play, I want us to remember that, you know what? Jesus is God in the flesh, and therefore He does know all things. Amen? And even as He's here at this time, and it seems a little tumultuous for the folks that are around Him, there's a lot of turmoil, there's a lot of talk in the streets about where He is and who He is and, and how we're going to go get Him. And I'm sure the scribes and Pharisees were doing a lot of the same things that are happening in our day today where they're trying to negate who Jesus is and get the naysayers to jump on that bandwagon to talk badly and poorly about Jesus Christ. But Jesus knows everything and He thinks about every detail because He is God in the flesh. And I want us to remember that. Verse number 9 here, it says, And they said unto Him, this is Peter and John, and they said unto Him, Where will thou that we prepare? And He said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, 
There shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber? Where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples. And he shall show you a large upper room furnished there, make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. You know, it's interesting to see the details and the focus that Jesus had. Jesus does know everything. As I said, He's God in the flesh. And some may think that you know, at this time there was something uh, miraculous that God did, that Jesus did here in the hearts of those men um, to cause them to know the disciples were coming and there was going to be a man with a pitcher. But you know what? Jesus is a... He's more than a professional planner. He's the master planner. Amen? He's, he's, he's the creator of this universe. And whether you believe that Jesus did suck something miraculous at that moment, or whether you believe that Jesus actually planned ahead at that moment and actually made arrangements with that man ahead of time uh, to prepare that room because he knew the day was coming. He knew some things were going to take place. Either viewpoint that you take in that, you must come to the realization that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Amen? And He sees things before they happen because He is God. And He takes care of these details for the preparation of that guest chamber where He's going to have that meal with His disciples there. The Bible says here, uh, down in, let's see here, verse number 13, And they went and found as He said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, He sat down and the twelve apostles with Him. You know, Jesus thinking of every detail as He prepares the hearts of His disciples yet again. And knowing that within that twelve, there is one that has a devil in Him. One that is there to betray Him. And I find it interesting that He prepares every single detail that's there, and the disciples are not aware of it. And as He asks them to do different things, I'm sure that they're, oh man, we didn't think of that. Where are we going to go? And all these things. And Jesus had already thought all those things out ahead of time. Now, just like I described to you earlier, I am not any kind of master planner. Scheduling hotel rooms and places to eat and things like that when you're out on the road and you're traveling, it's not the easiest thing to do. And I've, I've messed that up so many times, I, I, I don't have enough fingers and toes to count on it anymore. You know, I, I, I am a planner. I'm such a planner that, man, if I'm planning a trip and we're you know, making this big circle, I want to sit down before we leave and plan out all the hotel rooms. I want to plan out where we're going to eat and all these things. And you know, so often, those plans would fall to pieces because other things happen in the middle of that. And as a young man planning all these things out, boy, I remember traveling and, and, and heading uh, north and boy, I'm a guy that I don't want to have any problems with the cards, right? I've had problems with my card before where you try and use it and all the communication don't work and sorry, you can't pay for a room. So I thought, boy, I'll one-up that. I'm just going to bring a fistful of cash. Nobody could deny cash, right? You go and show up. Well, a hotel can deny you cash. And most of the time they do. They want your credit card. They want some type of card to go along with that. And I remember uh, heading up north and I thought I had it all figured out. And man, I got all the money. If the card don't work, I got cash. And well, the card didn't work. And we were up in the mountains and the communications were bad. And I thought, oh, no worries. I brought some money with me. And she says, well, that don't work here either. You actually have to have money. You've got to have your card. And I thought, man, what am I going to do? And, you know, the Lord worked it out and we were able to check into our hotel and everything worked well. But once again, at that moment, I realized that I'm not the master planner that I thought I was. And to be able to see Jesus Christ here, it just gives me more and more evidence of Him being God in the flesh as He's doing things ahead of time uh, before things happen. He's planning and He's doing things in great detail. And we know that Jesus gets it right every single time. Amen? Jesus gets it right every single time. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 20, it says, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. He does know all things. Do you believe that today? He knows all things. Amen? Listen to what the Bible says here in verse number 15. It says, And He said unto them, With desire, I have a desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I find that interesting in itself. The great love that Christ had for His disciples. 
and the desire that he had to come together with them and to share these things with him or with them. You know, I think of this, the Last Supper, as it's taking place here. Jesus has so many teachings in his ministry from when he was a young man until he came to this place right here. And I really view this time right here, this time frame of his life on earth as the last hurrah, if you will. He's, he's saying some things very plainly. He's being very serious about what he's talking about. He's got a message that means more to these disciples than they realize at this point in their very own lives. Verse number 16, he says, For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it unto them saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. The disciples didn't have any idea what he was talking about at this moment when he said this, and he's talking about his, his blood being shed. Verse 21 says, But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. Jesus knows everything, amen? He even knows that the devil has infiltrated one and he is sitting right at the table with them in this meal. John chapter 13, verse number 3 says this, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God. This is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who left the portals of heaven to come down to earth to complete a mission for all of mankind just to return there once again. And John chapter 13 reminds us of that. John chapter 16, verses 28 through 30 says this I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and I go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things. And needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou comest forth from God. Amen? There was a place where these disciples had witnessed miracle after miracle and teaching after teaching and Jesus prophesying of things to come that had not yet taken place and they finally come to the place where they said, we're convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that we believe, that we are sure that Jesus Christ has come from God. Verse number 31, Jesus' response. Do you now believe? Jesus said that very same thing. Do you now believe? Think about this. They see all these different things which have happened here. And they're still most likely a shadow of doubt within them because they're humans. Amen? Eyewitnesses to these things that have happened here. And yet Jesus continues to teach on with them. Verse number 24, the Bible says this, or I'm sorry, let me move back up to verse number 22. And truly the Son of Man goeth, and it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And here in verse 23, the Bible says, and they began to inquire among themselves. The disciples began to have all kinds of little sidebars and start talking with one another. Which of them it was, I'm sorry, they began to inquire of themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. And there was also strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. 
And so there's lots of different things that begin to crop up in their mind as they're listening to Jesus tell them these things. And, and some are wondering, man, who is the one that's going to betray him? While others were leaning to the flesh, really, and saying, man, who, who's going to be the best of us? Our Lord and Savior just got done saying that one here is going to betray him, but yet the conversation starts to evolve into something about, well, who, who here is going to be the best? Who, who here is going to sit on that seat next to the king? Who, which one of us is going to be that? I find it very interesting to see the places that the human mind can go to, even in the midst of the most trying circumstances in our life. Even when we think we're standing in that place where our, our, the ground that we stand on is sure and firm and we believe and we trust in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, there are circumstances that will come into our life that will cause that to be shaken because we're people. And we have our enemy in our ear constantly planning things in our mind trying to dissuade us from really trusting who Christ was. And I'll say who Christ was, it's who Christ is. Amen? Once again, He is God in the flesh. Verse number 26, the Bible says this, but ye shall not be so. Let me back up to verse 25 so I can get the, the words that precede this. And He said unto them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And he that is chief as he that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth. Is not he that sitteth at meat? But I am among you as he that serveth. Jesus is drawing that contrast here for the disciples to really see what it means to be the greatest in God's kingdom. It's not that one that's going to allow pride to crop up in their heart. It's not that one that is going to think that they are somebody. I saw a license plate on the way over here, and it had, uh, what was written on there was CEO4, and then it had some initials or something. I don't know what the initials were. I don't know what it stood for. But the person driving that car wanted me to know that he's a CEO of some place, right? And it's so easy. And I don't know the man. I don't know whether he's a good man, bad man, whether he's prideful or not. But it's so easy for us to think that we are somebody. And we are not. It's Jesus Christ who is everything. And He needs to be remembered in that special way. Verse number 28, the Bible says this, Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed unto me. Jesus is getting ready to share some things here with them of the reality of what's happening in His master plan. And He is God in the flesh. And He knows what the master plan is. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 16 says, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. We know all those things that Peter went through, and we know Peter kind of stepped in front of himself uh, before the Lord a couple of times, but you know what? He definitely came to that place where he recognized that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Amen. He lived with that man for many years. He saw the miracles that were there. He still had his very own doubts, but he knew in his own heart that Jesus was God in the flesh. Luke chapter 4, verse number 41 says this, And devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuking them suffered them not to speak, for they knew he was Christ. All those fallen angels that were tossed out of heaven that made the decision to go ahead and follow the devil in his rebellion against God, they know exactly who Jesus Christ is too. They know He's God's Son. They met with Him. They interacted with Him. We cannot ignore that as it's plainly referenced for us here in Scripture today. Luke chapter 22, verse number 67 says this, Art thou the Christ? Tell us. And he, being Jesus, said unto him, If I tell you, ye will not believe. 
It's so interesting to see what happens inside the heart of this fleshly body that we have. We can have so many things put before us that are open and obvious, and yet our heart, as the Word of God says, is deceitful and desperately wicked, and so easily infiltrated by the enemy and by our own fleshly thoughts. John eleven twenty seven 27 says this, She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Another reference of somebody coming to the conclusion that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. John chapter 6, verse number 69, the Bible says, And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus, born in the flesh, here on this planet to come and fulfill a specific message or a mission so that He can reconcile all the souls of this world or at least give us the opportunity to be reconciled back to God. John chapter 1, verses 1-3, through 3, very familiar. The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen? Word is capitalized here in our Bible for a very specific reason, because it's another name for Jesus Christ. Let me read it one more time. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was... God. It's very plainly illustrated here in Scripture. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Amen? This is Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, that we are talking about here. I'm so thankful for my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse number 30, he says this in Luke 22, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. You might as well put your own name in there if you're a believer today. Amen? Amen. The enemy still has the same desire to destroy God's children. He wants us to be of none effect for all the rest of those that are around us. He is desiring to sift us as wheat and our Lord and Savior being God in the flesh, He knows this. He knows His motive. He personally knows Him for He created that wicked being. Listen to what verse 32 says. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. We watch Peter as he goes through his life and as he is serving with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we see Peter doing this thing just like us, just like we do in today, right? We believe, we're solid, we end up going down in the valley, we end up coming back up. And Jesus here is reaffirming for Peter that he understands that the enemy is after him. But Christ is standing in the gap for him. Christ is standing in the gap for you and I. If you're a believer here today and you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can know that He is your advocate. He is my advocate. Amen? He is willing to stand before us. He not only went to the cross and took the punishment for our sin upon Himself, but afterwards, after we receive Him as Lord and Savior, He's still willing to be there, our intercessor, day by day by day, standing by our side, standing in the gap for us, encouraging us when we have nothing. And we know Peter went on to do amazing great things for the Lord as he came back out of that valley and he came back up. And you remember as Peter was so discouraged in his life where he came to this point where he decided he was just going to cash it in and go do what he used to do. It was just too much to deal with. Jesus had been killed. The Christians were being scattered everywhere and persecuted. And Peter comes to that place where he says, man, I go a fishing. I'm, I'm going to go back to what I used to do. 
I don't have to think about these things as much. I'm sure he had on his mind. Man, it's, it was so much more peaceful for me back in that day. But I know Peter recognized, just like I recognize, and probably you recognize, you can't ever go back to where you were and expect to have any kind of happiness at all. Especially in the place where you lived as a, a non-believer in Jesus Christ. You may think that there is hope in that area, but once you turn back and you truly look at those things, there is no hope and there is no happiness. There may be a little bit of pleasure for a season as you go back and participate in different sins, but you know what? You cannot live in that space and be happy once you're saved. It just does not work that way. And Jesus here, what an amazing Savior that we have as He reminds Peter that He is there with him and He's praying for him. He is our Advocate. Verse number 33 of Luke 22 says this, And He said unto them, Lord, I am ready to go with Thee both into prison and to death. Those are Peter's comments, right? And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow thrice, or not crow this day, before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Now, once again, I think this is probably the furthest thing away from Peter's mind that he himself would deny Jesus Christ. But I think, once again, this is a solid testimony found in God's Word of how God knew something that was going to happen before it happened, and it did take place. And not even this disciple, Peter, really understood that. And he was really going back at the Lord and saying, no, Lord, that's, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And that brings us to verse number 35 in Luke 22. And this is Jesus' response to that. And He said unto them, when I sent you without purse and script and shoes, Lacked ye anything? Did you have need for anything? You went with nothing. I called you to do great things for me. Did you ever find yourself in need of something? It wasn't like me when I was trying to take a business trip or go you know, here or there and forget packing my stuff and all this. Jesus had worked everything out for them. He's worked everything out for us. He's given us a path of success, I promise you. He is there to encourage our hearts and allow us to see that He is God in the flesh, if we'll pay attention. Remember the Scripture says, Jesus, they said, you know, art thou the Christ? Tell us! And He said, man, if I tell you, you're not going to believe Me. Because our hearts are deceitful and they're desperately wicked. But I would encourage you here today, if you are in this building today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have to take the Word of God at face value. You have to take the miracles of Christ at face value. You have to take the things that have happened in your very own life at face value and not discount them to say that they're just coincidence that they have happened. John 14.29 says this, And now I have told you before it come to pass, this is Jesus talking, that when it has come to pass, ye might believe. That's what God can do, Amen. If Jesus was just some ordinary man, just like you and I, there is no way that he'd be able to understand what's going to happen in the future. There's no possible way. There's not been a human on this planet that's tried to, that, uh, that has been able to do it. There's been a ton of them that have tried to do it, right? We've got a lot of people out there that have written books today that will tell us when the, when the earth is going to wrap up and when things are going to end. There's been lots of guys doing that for years and years and years, trying to say what's going to happen. In fact, a lot of the cults that are out there teaching uh, false teaching against Jesus Christ will claim that they have the answers, and they know what's going to happen in the end. But we know that they don't. Can you trust Him? There's just a few events that were shown to us today. Jesus knowing what's going to happen in the future before it happens. That's evidence that He's God in the flesh. Amen? Don't discount it. John 20, 31 says this, but these things are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. That's a motive of Jesus Christ. He's coming to tell us these things so that we can trust Him as Lord and Savior. Amen? 
The Bible very clearly tells us that every one of us that's been put on this planet, we are nothing but a bunch of sinners. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen? There is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible is very clear. I've been able to come to that conclusion in my life. I'm low down, no good. And I know that. That brought me to the place where I could finally bend my knee to salvation and receive that free gift that Christ was offering to me. But it started at that place where I'd recognize that I'm a sinner. And that I was in need of a Savior. That I didn't have the answers for everything and I was that, that, that person that was really doing things my own way and not following the way God would have me to do them. And I really needed to turn and repent of that sin and turn and trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone. The Bible tells me very clearly that He went to the cross to take my punishment and your punishment upon His very own body because He loves us so much. I told you here last week that my grandson Malachi, and he, he recognizes that, that Jesus came and stepped in and, and was going to take the paddling for him because he did wrong and he's the one that deserves to be spanked over that, but Jesus was going to step in doing nothing wrong because he loved him. He was going to step in and take that punishment. As adults, we sometimes will try and muddy that up. Jesus stepped in upon the cross of Calvary to take our punishment for the wrath of God that needed to be poured out on sinful mankind. And once again, He showed evidence that He was God by rising from the dead after He was placed in that tomb for a mere three days. Now, the whole planet celebrates that event. And I know it's been, it's been skewed and it's been taken and you know we, we'll put Easter bunnies around and eggs and all these things and if we're not careful we forget what Easter is really about now Easter is that pagan holiday amen resurrection Sunday is the day that Jesus Christ rose from the dead amen but we, and the people on this planet they know and recognize the resurrection of Jesus Christ now a lot of them won't believe it but it's something that has been documented in history the other great thing that we recognize on this planet all around the world is Christmas, His birth. And those two holidays right there, they resonate across this whole planet. You know, when I was in West Germany in the military, uh, uh, July 4th was approaching, and I was getting excited. Boy, July 4th is coming. I can't wait while well, I was forgetting I was in another country. They don't celebrate July 4th over there. There's no Independence Day for West Germany on July 4th. Uh, it didn't happen, right? And, and <coughs> excuse me. And uh, as I think about the things that we, we celebrate on this planet as human beings, you know, Christmas and Resurrection Sunday are something that the entire planet acknowledge. Whether they participate in it or not, they acknowledge that there's something that's happening there. And it's because Jesus is God in the flesh. He did come down here to take your punishment for your sin, for my sin. And He rose again after the third day to take His rightful place there in heaven. After He spent some time, He was witnessed by thousands of people after the resurrection. He didn't go back to heaven right away. The Bible gives us account after account after account of people physically seeing Him after He rose from the dead. Now, if you believe this book right here, you, you must come to the conclusion that He's God in the flesh. And I would encourage you to trust Him. If you haven't trusted Him as Lord and Savior, that's where it begins. Is you've got to acknowledge that and you've got to bend your knee. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen? Amazing verse that I see, verse number 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen? That means any low-down, no-good sinner like myself that decides to trust Him and bend his knee, Jesus is going to give you that free gift of salvation. Amen? Can you trust Him? As believers, we must trust Him to live a profitable life with Him and for Him. It's called faith. We really trust Him. I want to challenge you as believers today to trust Him. And I mean really trust Him. Even when He says here in His Word, I'm not going to drink again of this cup until I drink with you in my kingdom. Do you trust that that's going to be true? 
Do you think we're going to have some great banquet there where our Lord and Savior is going to be in the front and He's going to partake of that cup and eat of that bread? I believe it because I trust Him and He said it's going to be so. If you've not come to a place where you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I would beg of you to not discount God's Word and to not discount the different things that have even happened in your specific life where God has showed Himself to you. Don't deny it. Don't let the enemy get inside your ear and say, ah, that was just a coincidence that God rescued you from that. Ah, that was just a coincidence that that person happened to come and, and be able to step into the gap for you. We must trust Him. If you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior before, please come see me after the service is over. Come see Brother Greg. Let us have a deeper conversation with you about it from the Word of God. And if you're a believer today and you're discouraged because of the circumstances of life and the things that are happening for you, I would count it a great privilege to be able to pray with you about what you're going through. Because I beg of you to trust Him also. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen? He will not forsake us. Let's pray. Father, we do love you. We thank you so much for your word. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for sending Jesus Christ, your only Son, down to this earth to freely give his life. I don't take that for granted. I thank you for the encouraging words from your Bible.